This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know. And back to my enthusiastic promoting of an amazing cause, dailygiving.org. Daily Giving aggregates individual dollars from thousands of people every day and distributes it to vetted causes that are making a massive impact in our Jewish community across all different sectors. It is hard to recommend a more worthy and vital charity because really it is like your mutual fund for charitable giving with an incredible consistency and integrity to boot. This week, what a treat to speak with somebody who is of such great intellectual depth, who has been to the top of the mountain when it comes to academia, when it comes to publishing, grew up in a storied Israeli ninth generation family, has really done it all, and yet has become a passionate voice for Jewish tradition and identity in a very complicated and in some ways devolving world. He is a very strong social critic, a public intellectual of note, a great columnist at Tablet, host of the Unorthodox podcast, and quite a bit more. Very excited for you to hear Liel Leibovich's story on today's episode. Meanwhile, a reminder is always to follow us at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook, Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Comments or questions to Jews You Should Know at gmail.com. Follow or subscribe wherever you're listening, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or whatever particular app you may be using. Please spread the word to your friends and family. And now to our conversation with tablet editor at large, co-host of the Unorthodox podcast, social critic, video game expert, and delightful thinker, Liel Leibovitz. We are here with Liel Leibovitz, or Leibovitz. He'll tell us exactly how to pronounce it soon. He's got a V in there, so I'm not quite sure. But I do know that he is an acclaimed journalist, really fantastic writer, as well as a podcaster like myself with the Unorthodox podcast featuring a trio of hosts, a very fascinating podcast that we'll learn about as well. How are you, Liel? Baruch Hashem Yom Yom, a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Now, first of all, is it Leibowitz or Leibowitz? What's the correct? Let's let's settle this once and for all. Well, t- for the Mahadrin, it's Leibowitz. Uh, but here, for some reason, it's uh, hard to pronounce. So I go by Leibowitz. Nice. Even though I kind you got of the d- in there, w but- that V, yeah. Kind of smooth <laughs> it over. There we go. All right. We'll go with Leibowitz or Leibowitz. Wonderful. So given that little accent over there, that implies that you are not American born. And I believe that to be the case. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you are from. I am from the holiest, uh, the most promised. I'm a ninth generation Israeli, uh, grew up in Herzliya, uh, and and found my way here to the Upper West Side with the rest of the Yidden uh, in 1999. Well, it's funny because Herzliya, they, you know, they call people who live there the Tzvonim, right? Those who live in the northern Tel Aviv, the yuppies. And now you're in you know, northern Manhattan. So I guess it kind of uh, it, it makes sense. <laughs> but but uh, very, very different vibe uh, very different in vibe. northern Manhattan. <laughs> so you, you, nine generations in Israel, that's obviously, uh, for those, you don't have to be a history buff to know that that is well before the founding of the state of Israel in the modern incarnation. And, you know, many people are not aware of how consistent the presence of the Jewish people in the land of Israel has been over the centuries and millennia. Of course, that's gets into modern politics and, and many of the contentions surrounding the land itself. But what is your family's origin story, at least as you know it? Well, I am the oinacle of of a great. Uh, we, we could use we could use words like this here on this podcast, right? We could we could go all in. My great 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 was a somewhat acclaimed rabbi by the name of Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld, who was a a, a hardcore anti Zionist uh, Haredi rabbi who believed, God bless his soul, that the only place from which one could espouse anti Zionist sentiments is from the heart of Jerusalem. And so he left his Slovakian, I believe it was some kind of Austro-Hungarian place uh, where he was raised. Uh, He's a very fascinating figure. He himself lost his father when he was very young. His stepfather insisted that yeshiva was sort of, you know, kind of for 
the Nebishi and the and the misfortune that he wanted his his boy to uh, get a good education, so he sent him to the the equivalent of the Harvard uh, in those days. And Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld realized right away that he was looking at a major culture clash, and that one civilizational strand is not going to survive, and the other is forever. And so he left all of it behind and, and found his own way to yeshiva uh, and from there followed his own rebbe to, to Jerusalem. A very, very fierce person uh, led a life of, of sort of deep commitment to Torah from the old city of Jerusalem where much of my family still lives. We were the rebels. I was my grandmother was the rebel. She was the first one to become an immigrant to the Republic of Tel Aviv uh, <laughs> where she lived uh, her entire life until passing away two years ago. Why did she choose to move? You know, they, she had 11 brothers and sisters. Uh, they, they were you know, a large, large family and, and grew up in a very, very small apartment that felt stifling. And among them, there were those who found pleasure and comfort uh, in Torah and studies. Uh, there were those who found comfort in the community. Uh, and there were those who found comfort in imagining the possibilities of life outside this deeply airless shtetl. And she just remained committed, uh, obviously, to her family and obviously to her heritage. But she she was the one who wanted a taste of, of, of the good life. She wanted the beach, which for a Jerusalem-born girl was like a, a, an unheard of fantasy. She wanted to meet people from around the world. And she went to Tel Aviv and, and established sort of the, uh, the, the kind of Western branch of the family. And I sort of grew up on, I feel almost kind of like on, a, on the cusp, you know, academics like to talk of a, a liminal space because I always felt there was one foot rooted uh, deeply in the sort of secular cosmopolitan world of Tel Aviv, restaurant, bar scene, fun, film, you know, hip hop, video games. But another that still hasn't really left the old city, Jerusalem, tradition, the, the, the heritage of Yosef Chaim Zonenfeld, the sort of commitment to, to our values. It's a struggle that keeps on going. And, you know, depending on, on the mood and the hour, one side is always a little bit more dominant. So if, I, if I'm surmising correctly, it, it would seem that you probably have a very large, very religious extended family. Would that be an accurate uh, description? Gerer Hasids, most of them. Interesting. Although your great grandfather was not. No way. No. Interesting. So there was a migration there as well into the Hasidic sect of the uh, of the city at some point, which is also a pretty intense version of religiosity, but different than the old Jerusalemite Yerushalmi style that Rabbi Sonnenfeld was. At some point, someone read the Sfas Emes and decided to go all in. <laughs> That's all it takes. There you go. Be careful what you read. So was your personal background were you raised in religious schools? Were you raised in Tel Aviv? What was kind of the, you know, talking about that liminal space, what was your actual formal upbringing? What were sort of the societal parameters in which you grew up? You know, it's fascinating to me. This is something I think about all the time because I'm still trying to make sense of it uh, myself. So first of all, you know, growing up in Israel, the societal parameters, God bless them, are Jewish, right? The holidays you may or may not celebrate are very markedly felt. You, you never have to ask, oh, when's Pesach? Because everybody gears towards that. And, and Friday afternoons, I'm, I'm en route to Israel right now. And my favorite moment, I can't wait for it, is tomorrow to get to this moment in which, you know, you're, you're just sitting in a cafe in Tel Aviv and it's, you know, 2 p.m. on a Friday and everything slows down and Shabbos is, you know, palpable. But, you know, I definitely went to a secular school. Uh, I, I was definitely part of a of a community that understood itself to be much more Israeli than Jewish, uh, much more attuned to the winds coming from elsewhere. And I uh, had a life or an upbringing that I would consider traditional. Uh, we kept kosher. We had uh, Kiddush on Friday. Uh, we kept three hours between milk and meat. We, you know, observed all the holidays, Fast Yom Kippur, etc., etc. But if it's Shabbos, like, you know, hey, let's get in the car and, and go for a tiul, as we say in Hebrew, let's go for a little hike or or watch TV or, or you know, not worry too much about knowing too much <laughs> about, you know, Mishnah, Gemara, Talmud, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And for a very long time, this created a kind of sense in me. There was absolutely never any doubt about belief in God. There was not one moment in my life in which this wasn't uh, taken to be 
not only an, a, a, something I understand inherently to be the sort of engine, but also something that's actually quite meaningful uh, to me. But growing up and up until I would say somewhat recently, I had this feeling of like, well, you know, uh, the feeling is what counts. Uh, if I love Hashem and I'm proud of being Jewish, I'm good. Uh, you know, I could I could go ahead and I could... Uh, live in the larger world. And and when I got a little older, I uh, stopped keeping kosher. I, I started kind of, you know, eating all sorts of d- delightful uh, treats and, and told myself it, it was fine. I was, I was in, I was still very much within the bounds because in my heart, there was this connection. It took a very long time and I'm still working out the, the precise details uh, for me to start feeling that this was simply not true. It, one day, and it literally happened one day, I sort of woke up in the morning and was like, you know what, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I, I need to start keeping kosher. I can't explain why, but maybe I'll understand as it happens. I'm, you know, seven or eight years uh, into it now and five or six years into davening, you know, thrice daily. Um, and the wisdom of Judaism, uh, of, of, you know, na seven ishma, do first and understand later, is really uh, apparent to me now that I've actually followed these dikta. Fascinating because, you know, I work, my main job when I'm not uh, podcasting is I work in Jewish outreach. And I think one of the great challenges in communicating the importance of Jewish, not only Jewish ideas, but Jewish practice is that there is this paradox in which one can't really appreciate why they're doing something until they do it. Like you said, not seven Nishba, we will do, and then we will listen or we will understand. And yet what would actually precipitate a person to start doing it if they don't understand it, unless they feel some very deep calling. And so in your case, you know, it seems like there was almost these generations worth of historical imperative to kind of give you a bit of a, of a nudge to, you know, jump into the, the practical side of things. But for most people that isn't really there and absent that impetus, it's very difficult to spark a change in, in behavior absent that, you know, understanding. I hear you, but but I actually sort of disagree. You know, okay, good. <laughs> definitely, I, I can't, you know, in good faith claim that this this weight <laughs> slash guilt uh, of of generations of 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 observance wasn't there somewhere in the offing. But honestly, it, it was kind of a sense of a larger societal unease, to use an an, an perfect terminology. You know, look, I moved to America when I was 23. Um, I came here thinking that I will have a chance to partake in all things great and good, that if I work very hard uh, and go to a very good college and get my doctoral degree and get myself to a position of some prominence and people would actually listen to what I had to say. I would be a member in good standing of of the great uh, miraculous project known as Western civilization. And that was a very fine accomplishment indeed, uh, much more weighty than our own little airless Jewish project. Uh, And then a terrible thing happened. All of this came true. Everything I'd ever wanted. And I realized that I was arriving at the party at the exact moment in which the party was ending in an acrimonious way, uh, institutions like universities that I thought were the absolute seats of, of wisdom and passion and justice and truth and beauty revealed themselves to be kind of vile, highly politicized, highly corrupt locus of ideologies that were not only anathema to everything Jewish, but also to everything that I believed was at the core of Western civilization, to ideas like freedom of speech, which no longer exist in America. Became anti liberal in, the, in, in their, Correct. their own sets. Yeah. And it was shocking. The same thing happened in editorial boards uh, of newspapers, in publishing houses, in Hollywood. All, all these big uh, tools, these big industries that I thought, hey, man, if you really want to have an impact in the world, you need to be the Columbia professor who writes for the Times and, you know, publishes with, with Random House. And then, and then you get all these things, and you realize, oh wow, those things have all been collapsed. And and you started asking yourself the the, the most seminal, basic question that any sane person would: Okay, well then, what's true? What do I know one hundred percent for a fact, uncontrover- like incontrovertible, unquestionable, is one hundred percent eternal and true? And and then there's really only one answer, <laughs> and and the answer is Torah, and the answer is Judaism, and then you say, ah. 
you say you say a, a four letter word that I won't repeat <laughs> in the show. Darn. But then you say, <laughs> right, gosh darn it, I have to be serious. And and then when you look for ways to be serious, if you're someone like me who's a nerd who lives by reading books, you're like, okay, so I'm gonna read the book and I'm gonna get it. And then you read the book, it's like, I, I don't get it. <laughs> I don't get any of it. Because it becomes very evident if you're paying even a little bit of attention that this is a practice, right? Paul Rudd, the actor, said, that, you know, I'm, I'm not a practicing Jew because I perfected it. I don't need to practice anymore. But, but for the rest of us, it's a practice. And then you start saying, okay, well, then I need to go. I need to dip my toes in the water. And once you do, it's amazing. Everything changes. Everything changes. Your understand your heart changes. Your mind changes. Your understanding changes. Your perspective changes. This notion of starting your morning every day by putting on tefillin and praying shachos, even if you don't know what you're saying, even if you don't understand the origin of the prayer or or know very little about the deep, intricate mysticism represented in any of them, it doesn't matter. You've just made a choice to get up in the morning. And rather than rush to your, you know, your phone, like, oh my God, who's tweeting? Who's, who's, you know, on Facebook rather than go to your email, rather than like have coffee or read the newspaper. No, you're, you're, you're standing there and you're talking to Hashem. That to me, it puts, the whole day looks different. It just has to. Beautiful. And, you know, it's, I, again, I, I wonder to myself whether a person needs to reach sort of that end point, you know, the sort of the exasperation of getting everything they wanted and then realizing it's it's hollowness or if there's a way to hack that system, you know, to to have that realization earlier in the process. I don't know. You know, as, as I, I think about this all the time. Can we sort of artificially construct that experience for people so that they, they feel that earlier or not? I, I think not to purport to know Hashem's designs, but he truly does have a wonderful sense of humor and truly works in mysterious ways. And I think he's really helping us, uh, all those of us who ask this question, I think he's helping us along because uh, these last five, six, seven, eight years, he's been sending us uh, a bunch of, of cheerful plagues to help us understand that everything that we thought was solid and secure and good is falling apart. Uh, it started with, you know, the 2016 election and the and the sort of descent into chaos of our body politic and, uh, you know, continued right along with the uh, pandemic that's swept the entire globe. This is this is literally biblical stuff, right? This is him, I believe, telling us, stop, stop, mend your ways. You're not on the right path. Return, return to, to what you know is correct. And once people are starting to feel this feeling of like, oh, wow, Everything is broken. Everything is broken. They understand that just by admitting this, that everything is broken, that our medical system can no longer meet its challenges, that there are supply chain issues that mean that we can no longer, you know, have commerce the ways we intended, that our educational institutions have been corrupted, that our politics are irredeemably, you know, devastated. Once you acknowledge that everything is broken, you also begin to see the immense hopefulness that lies at the very heart of this statement because everything is broken means first and foremost that now we get to rebuild everything, that every single aspect of human life is now ripe for the remaking and reimagining better together with different coalitions of people, wider coalitions of people, more inclusive coalitions of people. And once you start feeling this way, I think the next step is, okay, well, I I need some kind of guide. And then you start sort of dabbling and you realize, oh, wow, these dudes uh, that we sort of briefly mentioned at the Seder, yeah, <laughs> they actually lived in the quintessential time of human brokenness. They lived in a moment of such complete societal breakdown. And yet, what did they do? They gave us the ultimate manual for living with defeat. They gave us the most impressive system mankind has ever created to imagining and pulling your way out of despair, uh, catastrophe, despondency. Uh, how about we listen to what they had to say? And once you do, it's it's easy street. Sounds like you have, you know, at your core, you have kind of a uh, a conservative impulse, though, you know, to look back on the traditions and institutions of old rather than say, well, the answers are somewhere out there in the future. Well, it's it's a brilliant question you're asking. And I think it gets to the core of really of, of what it's this moment in political time. I think if you look at, at things, you could make two assertions, right? The first is that the solution is somewhere out there in some future thing that we still haven't thought of, which is why we need to uh, not be afraid to cancel today what was ultimately true yesterday 
and uh, to wake up tomorrow knowing that today's resolutions could also uh, go out the window, which is a deeply troubling and disconcerting notion. Or you could say, look, yeah, call it conservative, call it liberal, call it whatever you want, but but there is a logic to tradition. Uh, there is a logic to people living life in search of what works. And then you start looking at Judaism more seriously, and you understand that rabbinic Judaism actually developed a pretty genius mechanism of dealing with this, which is a mechanism that delivered a whole host of space for change and growth, because in many ways it's bottom down. Uh, you know, if you can make any decree you want, uh, but we have this concept of if, if the public simply doesn't accept it, well, then it's not going to be. And at the same time, uh, it is top down governed by people who are very sensitive to and knowledgeable about tradition. And it gives space for growth and it gives space for change, but uh, doing so kind of cautiously rather than enthusiastically adopting something that may sound good today, but break our hearts tomorrow. I think that's a very, very wise model. Uh, I mean, it's neither inherently conservative nor inherently radical. Uh, it's neither left nor right. It's, it's also not always particularly, it doesn't always err on the side of religion per se. It's just a way of being in the world uh, that I find both wise and comforting. I want to rewind a little bit back to this young man that you were in Israel. I imagine you joined the IDF. I did. Tell me a little bit about that experience. And then from there, what prompted you to come explore the West? And, uh, and, and what were your early aspirations at that time? So I am one of those wretched beings on whom vocation was thrust very early. I, I knew what I wanted to do when I was seven. I always realized I'm going to be a writer simply because I demonstrably lacked the skills to do literally anything else. And it was very obvious. I mean, look, there's one thing you could do and literally everything else <laughs> you can. So just do the thing you could do. And so I knew I wanted to do this, which immediately puts you in a kind of a, of, of a weird quest for identity. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I would go to my high school library uh, and there were all these books there. And, and for the most part, because, you know, of, of the nature of, of world literature, the big names on the shelves, uh, they lived elsewhere. They all belonged to some brotherhood that felt very uh, cosmopolitan. And, and Israel at that time was still a very, very small country. This is before Waze and Fauda and Stissel and all those, you know, imports, technological and cultural. Pre-startup nation. <laughs> pre 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 startup nation and so i felt this kind of calling is like well if you really want to do this thing well don't you want to do it on the biggest stage possible i served in the army in the idf spokesperson's unit which was an absolute delight i got uh because i was one of very few able-bodied men in a unit that traditionally attracts uh, those whose uh, whose physical uh, attributes <laughs> are shall we say far from perfect I got to do a bunch of really interesting things and be in a bunch of interesting places, Gaza, Lebanon, a submarine in the middle of the Mediterranean, really sort of get to see how the army works, which which is a delight, served sort of in a haze of uh, of activity. Uh, and, and What talking. was going on during that period? Was this during one of the intifadas or what, what was happening? This was just before uh, the second intifada. This was the time of, um, it was Lebanon, the Israeli army was still in southern Lebanon. The late 90s? This is uh, early night. It's 93 to 97. Early 90s, okay. So, yeah. So really, really, really um, kind of in, in the thick of it. During um, the Robin's assassination, right in the middle of that. During, during Robin's assassination, right in the middle of that. Uh, got a, not a front row seat, but a, a pretty good seat uh, at the funeral. You felt like you were you know, a witness to these world historical events. But at that point, my attention was already, you know, hey, I, I, I need to practice this craft. I need to learn how to do this. I, I, I know that I need to conquer the world. You know, this sort of insolent, uh, hilarious, uh, pathetic, heartbreaking hunger a young man has for everything. Uh, how about I'm inspiringly idealistic? How about that? <laughs> no, I actually don't see it this way. Uh, <laughs> I've thought about this a lot. It, it wasn't. It was insecurity masquerading as ambition. It was a search for validation, still believing that validation came from external sources, which of course you could read, you know, three pages of Talmud, uh, Mishnah and understand that yeah, that's not how it works. It comes from within. Uh, and once it comes, you feel at peace anywhere. You feel at peace in Davos with world leaders and you feel at peace in, you know, your, your little chavruta with the dude across the street. 
but I didn't have that yet, uh, and uh, I wanted out. So I, I finished the army and then went and got my um, my bachelor's degree in film studies in Tel Aviv University, which was funny because literally the only thing that you needed to register was your ID card <laughs> and, a, and a check for 150 shekels. Like, do you want to go here? Show us that you exist and give us a little bit of money, and you can. <laughs> you're welcome. It that's was like basically great. cheaper than actually going to watch the movies. You know, in a theater. That's right. <laughs> and, and 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 that's that's exactly right. And that's what I thought. I was like, I could pay 20 shekels to go see this movie every week, or I could just sit here and watch all the movies I want. Uh, so I had a blast there and worked writing for a late night uh, comedy show, the first one on, on Israeli TV, and, you know, made a little bit of money, uh, but always knew that the moment I'm graduating, and I, I managed to graduate in a, a, a remarkable, you know, fast period of time. It took me like a year and a half to get my you, bachelor's you degree. You binge-watched all the movies. <laughs> I binge-watched all the movies. I indulged in other, uh, you know, uh, so we say stimulants that we will not discuss uh, on the air right now. A lot of Coca-Cola. Uh, I got it. But yep. a, a lot of things that sound like Coca-Cola. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, and, and then managed to write, you know, all the requisite papers. And the moment I could, I came here. And again, the plan was simple. Uh, I would find some job that sustained me. I worked at a hardware store first and then, and then for the Israeli consulate for a bunch of years. I will find my way to Columbia University where the smart kids went, I will get a master's in journalism uh, because that's how you get contacts and, and uh, kind of agents and things of that nature. Uh, I will then stay on for the PhD program because smart people had PhDs from good universities. Uh, I will get a teaching job at a, at a good swanky school like NYU. I'll have an office overlooking Washington Square Park. I'll teach something cool like video games, which is a passion of mine. And that would be life. Dinner parties with Salman Rushdie and kind of cocktails and fancy Upper East Side bars and interesting conversations about philosophy into the night with tremendous people. All these things happened. And at the same time, everything around me was falling apart. They did not feel sustaining because the institutions themselves felt predicated on these false notions. No one around me was actually committed to the pursuit of ideas. Everyone was committed to uh, maintaining their their good standing status in these, these little clubs that I actually didn't care about. Because by that moment, I, I wasn't feeling insecure anymore uh, because I've achieved everything I wanted to achieve. I wanted the real deal. And once I realized I didn't have it, I just left everything and and committed myself to, again, the thing that felt true and joined uh, my good, dear friend, Alana Newhouse, when she uh, founded Tablet Magazine 12 years ago uh, Happy today. Happy anniversary. Uh, which is the greatest <laughs> ride. Well, thank you. It wasn't, I mean, it's actually in July. I just said this year. Oh. <laughs> um, it's words. We'll you know, pretend. We'll right. Uh, every day feels like, like, <laughs> like an anniversary when, when you're part of something so great and nurturing and nourishing and started really sort of thinking and writing uh, very seriously about Jewish life and Jewish issues and, and my own Jewish journey. And, you know, I've been happy as a kosher clam ever since. So, you know, if, if I could offer the following dichotomy, you know, maybe two possibilities. Do you feel like within these institutions that you were occupying, where you were finding such success and, and sort of that the cliche almost of success that you had anticipated all coming to fruition. Did you feel that there's maybe there's like kind of a silent consensus that there is a, an institutional rot or an emptiness, but most people just don't have the courage or the, the gall or maybe the Israeli chutzpah to get up and do something about it. You did, but really most people fundamentally, if you'd get them in a, in a moment of, you know, of a rare honesty, they would acknowledge the same deficits or is it like, the music is just playing on the Titanic and everyone's dancing around and having a good time. And you're like, hello, everyone, <laughs> like, you know, hop off the, uh, onto the raft guys. And, and, and nobody is really actually even thinking about these things. Like, what's your perception having been on quote unquote, the inside about whether or not there is some broader sentiment about these, the, the realities going on today. I'll use a story. I, I hope she doesn't mind me sharing it. It's a story about my my dear friend Alana, who I who I just mentioned. We uh, recently and Tablet placed an ad uh, in the New York Times for Tablet magazine. Here, learn about us, come read us. And a bunch of our friends who know how we feel about this vile, gross, anti-Semitic publication committed to nothing but the dissemination of you know kind of propaganda. 
and some wordles and some wordles <laughs> and some wordles which which I've I'm very proud of myself I, I have not yet downloaded so <laughs> I have a lot to look forward to asked us are you kidding us like you're you're giving money to the Times to run an ad like what's wrong with you and Alana said something like you don't understand the Times is Antebi I'm just going to get my hostages I don't care about what happens in Uganda after that. It's not my problem. My problem is that there are a bunch of people who still read this newspaper because it used to be very good not so long ago. And now they don't know where to go, so they're still there. It's the same with academia. There are a lot of people there who are incredible people who committed themselves to this life because they believed in these ideals. They believed in freedom of speech. They believed in unfettered inquiry. They believe in sort of like you know, robust exchange of opinions and, and, and getting to the bottom of things. They believed in real intellectual, emotional diversity. And now it's their livelihood. They can't afford to say, well, you know, I'm just going to go elsewhere and do something else because they've devoted their entire career to it. So I see this all the time. In fact, it's one of the most heartbreaking elements of leaving this whole behind is that you know when you walk out the door, you're leaving all your hostages behind. And the hostages aren't only the you know scores of good people you know are out there struggling. More importantly, they're students who you understand are now being forced to play a part in the sick dynamic of paying a king's ransom for what they believe is a good education, which instead is a kind of steely, mirthless, and and pointless exercise in recitation of dogma. And on top of that, they're not going to get any jobs because the economic market has changed in a way that a college degree no longer guarantees anything. And you feel terrible for these kids, especially the Jewish ones, who on top of all that insecurity also have to tolerate, you know, assaults on their core identity unless they disavow themselves from anything that has to do with with Jewish pride, which is why, you know, I wrote an article a few years back that got me into a lot of trouble. I stand more and more by it with every day. Get out. I say to my kids, they're now 10 and 8, I say to them at least once a week, in, in all seriousness, you are never going to college. You are never going to college. You could go to Israel. You could go to West Point and join the army, or you could go to yeshiva. But other than that, if you choose to go to college, that's completely on you. Because what I want for you isn't some degree conferred by my mutually uh, accrediting mediocrities. What I want for you isn't some membership in a club that hates you. What I want for you is actual education. And you can no longer get that in American universities right now. There may be exceptions to that rule here and there. I imagine those listening to us right now saying, well, wait a minute, but in my alma mater, things are better. Maybe, but systemically, overall, across the board, the American educational enterprise, it is collapsing. Sounds like it's a great infomercial for uh, University of Austin. (laughs) I actually, look, I'm close close friends uh, with a lot of people involved in this project, and I wish them all the best. Uh, and I, I am praying that I'm wrong uh, in what I'm about to say, but but I'm very skeptical because, you know, to be one university fighting in this landscape against a whole angry sea of institutions that have the benefit of tremendous resources, reputations, connections, I'm not entirely sure. What I'm personally more interested in is is thinking of Alternate models. I'll give you just one example because I'm, you know, this is the type of stuff that keeps me, you know, up at night. Our Haredi brothers have come up, uh, who, by the way, as as time goes by, I think are proven to have gotten more right uh, than anyone ever got gave them credit for. I have this amazing institution that I love uh, called the Koila. Uh and the Koila is predicated on, on several premises that I think we need to pay attention to. First of all, the worst thing that could happen to you is if you're really, really, really smart 18-year-old leaves your community behind and goes to live somewhere that's, you know, 3,000 miles away and then joins some, you know, ephemeral class of ruthless cosmopolitans never ever to return home again. You really kind of want a good way to keep everyone in the community because that's how communities stay strong. Second of all, the notion of institutions having to be democratic. So to say to someone, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to identify the best and the brightest. And if you're one of those people, we're going to pay for you to study the greatest privilege ever. Here's what you have to do in return. At 6 or 7 p.m., when Nachman, the dentist, uh, is done with his day or Shulamit, the teacher, is done with hers, you have to teach them something. You have to give them a little kind of adult education, which which is wonderful because 
it then feels like a truly educational institution and not some finishing school for the wealthy and privileged. It's models like this that I think will 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 make the future much more animated and much more interesting rather than saying, oh, well, they have their Harvard, we'll have our Harvard. I, I don't like that kind of thinking. I like new, bold ideas. Tell me a little bit about Tablet itself, you mentioned, uh, you know, it was founded exactly 12 years ago today or <laughs> something, some somewhere thereabouts. But, um, you know, a lot of new health I, who I've never met before, but I've, I've read. What was the concept? Was, was this the idea that there needed to be sort of a, a repository of quality Jewish writing or Jewish oriented writing that was free of political, you know, considerations or, or indoctrination? What was what was the vision of this publication? Man, it's so interesting because, as I said, 12 years ago, today, but a different life in a different world, right? You know, when we started, our logic was very simple. It's like, look, we're never going to be anyone's first read. That's always going to be the Times or the New Yorker or the prestige publications. We are very proud and rooted in our Jewish identity and life and spirit. We don't want to be the voice or the mirror of any one kind of definition of Judaism. In fact, we revel in the Lubavitcher Rebbe's cautionary reminder that there are no Orthodox Jews and Reformed Jews, Conservative Jews and Reconstructionist Jews, Secular Jews and Religious Jews. They're just Jews. And if you are one of them and you're happy about it, then you're curious about all of them. And that's kind of what we wanted to do. It's it's for curious Jews. And we wanted to really create something that felt like a really big tent in a time where where big tents were very out of fashion, <laughs> you know, in a time where sort of like wearing your your stripes, your sort of varsity letters on, on your sleeve w- was really kind of the, 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 the bone tone. And so we did this and assembled, again, I, I cannot give Alana Nuas enough credit for her absolute brilliance and genius at, at, at doing this, at assembling this team of, of Jewish Avengers to uh, to create this, this incredible publication, and really sort of were surprised that what we had always assumed would be a small readership can kept growing and growing and growing and growing, and included a lot of Jews of all stripes that you will not traditionally find together in the same place, and, and, and then also a lot of non-Jewish readers. And then something really interesting happened. This collapse, this societal breakdown that we have been so cheerfully talking about started happening and people began realizing that the journalistic institutions that they turned to for so long are no longer there. Uh, They're there in name. You could still visit Rome. Uh, It's still a city. There's still ruins in it, but it's no longer any meaningful seat of a real thriving live empire through no stretch of the imagination. When you start understanding that and understanding the extent to which these institutions have allowed themselves to drift apart from from their original meanings, you're shocked. When you see, for example, um, something like COVID happening and you have normal questions like, how did this pandemic start? Then Tablet runs a story. Well, you know, there's one pretty credible theory that actually gels nicely with common sense that it was uh, uh, leaked out of a lab in Wuhan. At which point, of course, every media, mainstream media organ on earth says that is a xenophobic, racist conspiracy theory. It's misinformation. It must be censored. Facebook makes all of these articles disappear, uh, which is another shockingly troubling phenomenon that this major news source for many Americans could just make stuff go away and we're left uh, accused of being you know tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theory adult maniacs fast forward to a year and a half later when all the political expediency of not repeating the lab leak theory it no longer matters because the election's been won and we don't no longer care uh all of a sudden the same publications that denied this theory say wait a minute what about a lab leak theory? As <laughs> if the last 18 months never happened, as everything is a memory hold in this crazy, deeply troubling way. And you start seeing them do it and say like, wait a minute, why am I not allowed to ask basic questions? 
You know, why if I ask about the efficacy of masks and point out that according to very easy to find research, there's certainly evidence to suggest that there are some benefits, but very far from the widespread, oh my God, this will save your life and you're a monster for refusing to wear this and to say nothing about kids for whom there's no credible information uh, whatsoever about the, the benefits of masks. As soon as you start even remotely mentioning it based on medical studies that you could quote, you're a zealot, you're a maniac, you're a conspiracy theorist, you're this, that, and the other. When you understand you live in this kind of reality, then you start leaving behind all those old sources of information and, 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 and you seek new ones. And Tablet is one of very few, I would venture to say, really kind of the only one out there that is still having a good, old-fashioned, fact-based, rational debate that invites divergent points of view in to present, you know, observable reality. It sounds so banal, but that's where we are. And I think it attracted a, a, a huge number of, of new readers to us. And I think it attracted a whole kind of ecosystem of writers, many of whom used to live on, on diametrically opposed polar opposites of the of the political universe, you know, just four or five years ago. And that's tremendously exciting. I, I can't even tell you how proud I am to be a part of this. Tell me about the podcast. It has a very provocative title, Unorthodox. You know, it's, as I understand, it's a couple of colleagues is bantering together about issues of the day. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit about how it materialized and, and what its goals are. Unorthodox is, according to Hashem and iTunes, the world's most popular Jewish podcast, <laughs> for which we're amazingly, amazingly, amazingly proud. And may all Jewish podcasts be able to one day say this, because, of course, all Jews have to be the greatest. Uh how did it start? Five years ago, today, I got a call from my dear friend, Mark Oppenheimer, who is a tablet contributing editor and, and back then was the New York Times religion columnist. And he asked, would you like to be in a podcast with me? And I, it was just before Shabbos, Friday afternoon, I was sort of nodding my head uh, on the phone and said, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, and he told me he'd also asked one of our colleagues named Stephanie. Like, by the way, what's a podcast? <laughs> No, no, that's, hold on, because that's exactly where the story is going. He also uh, made the same offer to to our colleague, Stephanie Butnick. So I hung up the phone. I said, sure, sure, sure. I hung up the phone. I called Stephanie and I said, could you believe this absolutely stupid idea Mark just had? And Stephanie said, right. I mean, it's the dumbest thing because he thinks we're interested. Like, who'd want to listen to us? Plus, who listens to podcasts? And, and why is this interesting? Plus, a Jewish podcast? What audience is it for a Jewish podcast? It's like, what, three people would tune in to hear like a Jewy podcast? Like, immediately, just as we had this conversation, we started doing this like, ugh, voice, like a Jewish podcast. Like, like there's Kasha <laughs> stuck in my beard, you know? Like, it was, so it's just sort of like, uh, the, the whole thing just struck us as distasteful, but Mark is very persuasive and he said, no, listen, it'll be very fun. We'll have a Jew of the week and then a Gentile of the week and we'll ask them questions and they'll ask us questions and then we'll have news of the Jews and Mazel Tov, so it'll be great. And so not to disappoint our colleague, we decided that the uh, uh, politique course of action is to say, sure, buddy, we'll do your little thing with you uh, and then do it for like a month and then, and then watch as it sort of fizzles into oblivion uh, becomes totally irrelevant and then say hey man sorry we tried can we please stop wasting our time now and so we started i invite everyone to not listen to our first five <laughs> six episodes because they are uh atrociously bad <laughs> but but something really interesting started happening first of all jews listened which is a miracle in of itself second of all this this may come as a surprise rabbeinu but jews uh, have opinions that they want to share with you. Uh, they actually want to talk to you uh, and let you know what they think. And so they started writing us notes. And and the notes were fascinating. Because look, when we started, we did, you know, bits like, oh, uh, is Andy Samberg the new Adam Sandler? Like total, you know, nourish guy. But what the notes were telling us, and it came as kind of a shock, but it was also a tremendous eye opener, is that a lot has changed in American Jewish life in the last 50 or 60 years, but our institutions haven't always been able, for a host of reasons, some justified, others less so, to capture these shifts. And therefore, a lot of people felt like they had so much passion 
for exploring their Jewish identity, but not really a space to do it in. A lot of people feel uncomfortable in synagogues. Uh, Some people don't have a robust Jewish community around them, and others have a form of Jewish identity that they feel, rightly or wrongly, is at odds with the sort of mainstream of American Judaism, maybe because they're Jews of color, maybe because they're trans Jews, maybe because they're Jews who identify in one way or another that just doesn't feel like it's welcomed elsewhere. And so they came to this podcast and they started treating this podcast as their Chavruta, as their Bet Midrash, as their community, as their JCC. And they started challenging us to be better, to ask better questions, to address all these discrepancies, to talk, for example, about our Ashken normativity, uh, the condition of thinking that, you know, all American Judaism is limited to Ashkenazi Jewish, you know, normative food and culture. And that was amazing because A, it opened our eyes and B, we saw how much it meant to people. When we get notes and I'm the, the greatest privilege of my life to get these notes often that say, hey man, you know, every Thursday morning, you're my lifeline to to Judaism. Like I do this, maybe I'm in Alaska where there are very few other Jews around me or in studying in Norway or whatever. Maybe I'm in a city where there are a lot of Jews, but I just don't feel connected to them. But then I turn this show on and I hear, you know, jokes about some Gedalia and I hear, you know, some Holocaust humor and I hear, you know, arguments about toasting bagels and I hear everything from the, from the sacred to the profane, from the serious to the silly and makes me feel like I'm, I'm connected to it. There's nothing better. There's nothing better in the world. There's no greater honor for us. Uh, and we will do this for as long uh, as they would let us. We're now six years in. We have a book, the newest Jewish encyclopedia, which is fun. Uh, the subtitles from Abraham to Zabar's. The last entry in the book isn't Zabar's. It's Zyklon B, but we thought that would look in very poor taste on the cover. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's it's our way of being part of a thriving, wonderful, global community of, of Jews and Jewish adjacent people. Our greatest kind of crown jewel of every season is the conversion episode uh, that we do every year in Shavuos that welcomes Jews home after completing their, their conversion process. Uh, and, and to hear those stories uh, of, of, of those people, Jews by choice, and to hear stories of Jews not by choice, uh, <laughs> by, by birth, it's just, what a trip. Why the word unorthodox? Why is that the, uh, the title? Because we're bad at names and we had all kinds of suggestions and ideas and figured out that they were kind of all didn't work. No, no one, no one wanted. The I, tablet I forget what podcast that. wasn't uh, wasn't popular. The tablet podcast is is the equivalent of the Washington sports team, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you just don't just don't do <laughs> well, that. Then, but we can uh, call it the Commanders podcast. The Commanders. <laughs> uh, we we thought an Orthodox went well, even though, as you could see uh, by by my head. Uh, that description doesn't really suit at least some of us, but we like the spirit of it because we we think that there is something wonderfully unorthodox about Judaism. By the way, I, I would venture out and say I'm only speaking for myself here, not my my co-host, but particularly about Orthodox Judaism. Uh, you know, to buy into Orthodox Judaism is to buy into an intrinsically, inherently, deeply unorthodox lifestyle, because. Again, not to wax poetic, but I am writing a book about the Talmud now, so this is very much how I'm thinking. You know, how easy would it have been for these guys after the destruction of the temple to say, look, we're just going to write down a a list of uh, laws. Just follow these freaking rules, man. We know them. They're not hard. Like, do this, 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 and don't do that, 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 and the other. They realize that as soon as you do this, you're basically inviting people to say, well, this doesn't really apply anymore and this is our kick and I'm going to skip these two and three. So instead of doing this, they, they, they wrote down their arguments, their conversations, the logic, the reason. They invited you to join in the argument and in the conversation. The most amazingly frustrating and rewarding thing for me is is when I speak about, you know, Talmudic issues to, to people who aren't very, you know, kind of knowledgeable about it and, and I present like a sugiya problem or a question and they're like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, so what does the Talmud say? What's the answer? It's like the answer <laughs> how dare you <laughs> assume that there's an there's no answer i mean there's halacha but come on man like it's the discussion that we're in that is that is a wonderfully unorthodox element and and we wanted to um to capture the spirit and and we do look we see the world the three of us very differently uh we have different beliefs uh political uh, religious uh you know 
emotional, we have different dispositions. Uh, we come at things very, 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 from very, very different perspectives. And yet we love each other genuinely and we respect each other truly. And we're able as tragically fewer and fewer people, especially Jews, are able to do these days to hold space together and, and have community together and have real conversations. To us, that is that is extremely important, not to let these silly labels, not to let these differences, you know, rend us apart, but rather to focus on what brings us together. Well, it must be interesting for you as someone who grew up in kind of this, in this sort of traditional, but not strictly observant home, and then has sort of found more conventional observance in an unorthodox fashion <laughs> in your own later years to now sort of be the representative of kind of the orthodox perspective, if you will, or the, you know, the traditional perspective on this most widely digested uh, Jewish podcast in the world, right? Is that an interesting place for you to be? It's so interesting to me. And look, I am really, I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I get to be sufficiently rooted in these things to kind of hop them as we say in uh, Aramaic, kind of intrinsically, but also at the same time to be enough of an outsider and a newcomer to all this. To me, Jewish observance is punk rock. Like I come to this, like, this is, could you believe how cool this is? <laughs> Can you believe Shalasuda? It's a great mouth and Malka. Can you believe we have this thing? It's amazing. Oh my God. Look at Masilis Sharim. It's the most... The and like my energy uh, when I when I look at this is is still sufficiently and, and I hope it remains so forever outsidery because I, I never went to yeshiva you know no one ever sat there and said like you must recite this you know my just was some some elementary school and on you know right on the beach and so coming to it as 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 an adult and embracing it with you know the full force uh, of passion I think gives me this kind of viewpoint that is. That is helpful uh, for for others like me to hear, because I think for a lot of our and I, I abhor those definitions. But for I don't want to use the word secular. I don't actually believe in it. Th- th- those of our listeners who aren't observant, if they look at a person uh, who looks like Chabadnik, for example, they'd say, "Well, you know, this person is probably nice. Uh, they're probably well-meaning, but they're probably trying to." I don't know. They're probably trying to convert me in some way. They're probably trying to get me to do something. I don't. I, this is this is not my people. Um, and I look at a dude like me, uh, and I, I have a PhD in video games from Columbia. Uh, I I wrote a, a biography uh, of Leonard Cohen. You know, whatever sort of pop culture achievement you want to unlock, I've done it. Uh, and at the same time, to hear someone like me saying that the coolest thing uh, you could do with your time is, you know, Shnai Mikra Hatargum. I think that's I think that's rad. It's a lot of credibility. Yeah. It's it's you know, Shnai Mikra better than Call of Duty, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And also just to speak about it in a way that that you know that 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 would resonate with this audience that isn't, you know, it doesn't come off as necessarily a shivish, that doesn't sound like it's uh you know uh, uh, overly uh complicated or demands uh intricate levels of of already pre-existing knowledge look i'll tell you about the greatest surprise of of, of my career uh so two years ago now uh on a thursday i got a call from our producer josh cross uh and josh says to me oh, wow i just read this amazing story about this thing called Siyum hashas do you know about this I was like, yeah, it's amazing. Isn't it amazing that Jews read one page of Talmud every day? She's like, yeah, it's really cool. So um, so a new cycle of Dafyomi is beginning Sunday, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, that sure is. Did you ever do it? And I said, nah, man, you know, I read a little bit of Talmud. I know a bit, but not not too much. And he said, because that would make an amazing podcast. And I said, yeah. And he said, but we'd have to do it daily. And I said, Yeah. And he said, and we'd have to start Sunday. And I said, yeah. <laughs> and so I called Alana, uh, our, our fearless leader, and I said, hey, um, you know, we talked about a bunch of other things. Like, oh, by the way, uh, I'm starting a daily podcast on Sunday. That's a seven and a half year commitment, <laughs> which any normal boss, any other work environment, any other place in the world would get you like, you know, a letter from HR, like, please don't harass us. You're insane. And Alana's like, Hey, that's great. It's a great idea. So we start this thing, take one. And the idea was to have six minutes every day, eight minutes, very, very, very short episodes that look at one little element from each stuff. 
and and show people how these conversations are completely as relevant and as meaningful and as vibrant today as they ever were. And do it not just by talking to to rabbis, although that's very, very important, but also talking to to other humans in the world. So for example, when we see the story about, you know, Shimon ben Shetach being summoned by by his sister, the queen, uh, to sit before uh, her husband, the, the ruthless king who had killed all the Torah scholars. And, and Shimon Meshach is not afraid at all. He does not bow before the tyrant. And the tyrant says, aren't you afraid of me? And, and the rabbi says, no, because I, you know, I answer to a higher authority. I read the story and I called, uh, you know, my friend Ennis Cantor, or as he's known now, Ennis Cantor Freedom, uh, the NBA star who's paid a dear, dear price for being a dissident uh, against, uh, you know, Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, and I said, hey, man, check out this piece of Talmud. Does this resonate with you? And he writes back right away like, oh, my God, this is amazing. This is precisely what I aspire to do with my, you know, activism standing up to Erdogan. I said, come on the show, talk about it. You know, Representative Katie Porter, the Democratic congresswoman from California, when you read this bit about even if all the seas were ink, you know, et cetera, et cetera, about government work and how it's, you know, such a big kind of weight and responsibility, does this track with your own experience as a legislator? She's like, oh my God, this is fantastic. This is exactly how I feel. We'll come on the show and talk about it. So we started this thing that we thought would be for, I don't know, maybe a couple thousand people who cared about Talmud. We have grown much, much, much larger than that now. And and I really uh, dearly uh, want to say that the fact that we now have millions of downloads uh, is because I am very talented uh, or smart or really, really good at podcasting. I don't think any of that is true at all. I think it's just the incredible power of what happens when you just introduce these tremendous, timeless truths to people and and remind them that they own it, that the Talmud is yours. It's your operating system. Just you know, plug into it, plug into something that's already there. And that's it. Let me get out of the way and, and, and let you do it. When that happens, I think the enthusiasm that you build is intense and, and the audience that you could have partaking in it is much, 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 much larger than anything you would think a quote unquote religious or Jewish show would command. Yeah. What's uh, just in closing, what is next for you? Obviously you're continuing to write, continuing to podcast. Are there any major projects that you're working on a book not the Talmud. What are the big offerings in the, on the rise? Look, anytime I, I meet someone, I, I, I use a line I stole from a, from a nice Chabadnik I met. I work full time for Hashem. Uh, that's that's the job description. You know, the benefits are great. The HR department is really strict. You should see our review process once a year. It's really hardcore. You can't eat for a day. You have to wear white. It's there's a lot. Uh, but I love the fact that I get to do this in, in different ways. The, the big main projects are, I would say, uh, two or three. First of all, we have recently expanded our podcasting empire and tablet. Uh, we now have something called Tablet Studios and produce more and more shows, uh, new shows and, and, and seasons, uh, new seasons of, of existing shows. We put out a great documentary about Father Coughlin, uh, the notoriously anti-Semitic radio semi, host, right? Yeah. So it's an eight-part documentary series that you know tremendously proud of. We put out uh, this great show called Adventures with Dead Jews starring Dara Horn. Uh, yes, which who I interviewed on this podcast several uh, weeks ago or several months ago. I just say, an yes. incredible, incredible thinker and and writer. He's awesome. So making podcasts is is the first uh, kind of big project that I'm excited about. The second is this book that you mentioned. It's uh, as of yet untitled book that tries to look at the Talmud as what I actually believe it is, which is a manual for living with defeat, a guide to life in the time of brokenness, and it it focuses on. 10 different problems, the problem of grief, the problem of family, the problem of love, and introduces readers to Talmudic rabbis and principles and way of thinking uh, in an effort to show that their discussions, uh, their disputations, their prescriptions uh, were far from relegated to that particular historical moment in time or only to those of us who are observant Jews, that these are timeless ways of of thinking and looking and being in the world that all of us, but particularly us American Jews, and particularly now in this very deeply troubling time we live in, could absolutely benefit from. Very exciting. Liel Leibovich, Leibovitz, we'll pronounce it uh, however you want to pronounce it. The, uh, the, the man is the same. 
someone of, of tremendous aspiration and intellectual honesty and really uh, such a treat to speak with you. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your writing and uh, have really enjoyed your unique voice in so many different forums. Thank you so much for joining us. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much and Shabbat Shalom. And just a final reminder to join me as a daily donor to dailygiving.org. You will be thrilled with yourself for days, months, and years to come. Dailygiving.org, proud sponsor of Jews You Should Know. Please join me in signing up right now. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at jewsyoushouldknow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews You Should Know.